Hello and welcome to Cherries with Army. If you're new around here, please do subscribe and smash that like button because the gloves are off in this video. We have got four points between 12th and 20th in the Premier League and we're going to talk mainly about three football teams in this video. In the Nottingham Forest corner, we have got Matt Davies from the Gary Baldy Red Podcast. How are you doing, Matt? Uh, good, thank you. I wasn't sure I'd get back on this after saying I thought Bournemouth would go down at the start of the season, so I'm glad you've had me back on. No, it's absolutely fine, Matt. And do tell us again and remind us about your podcast and how the podcast is going this season. Uh, well, it's going really well after getting promoted. A lot, a lot more uh, interest in it. It's kind of exploded. Come out every Monday with an hour-long podcast with a uh, a regular fan who's basically mates of mine and then former managers and players. So we had Paul Hart on our last recording today talking about the Newcastle game and then a second shorter episode in the week. Generally looking forward to the the game at the weekend, but it's going really well, thanks. Now, my second guest, we do know very well as Bournemouth fans. He covered Bournemouth last season for Dorset Live. This season, he travelled a little while up the road to cover Southampton for the Athletic. It's the very good Jacob Tanswell. How are you doing, Jacob? I'm doing well, Kurt. Yeah, good to be back uh, on a albeit different capacity, but yeah, I'm looking forward to this. And although we'll be talking about stuff on the pitch, how is it going with the Athletic this season? Good. It's a lot different to Dorset Live. A, f a lot less articles, but a little bit more research. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a it's been an educational year. It's been a lot going on, and uh, the third manager in. Hopefully, now we can just calm down a little bit and and focus on survival now. My final guest, as Bournemouth fans will know very well, actually as a football fan, you'll know this guy from Sky Sports, but he's got cherries in his heart. He's going to be fighting the corner for Bournemouth this evening. It's Mark McAdam. How are you, Mark? Yeah, good. Thanks, Kurt. And from transfer windows to soccer Saturdays, how's it going this season for you on Sky Sports? Um, it's every season at Sky Sports is like a machine. It's like a factory. You just you jump in and in sometime around June, July, and, and then before you know it, you're getting towards the end of April, beginning of May, and another season's done and dusted. So um, you don't get the opportunity to come up for breath very often. Uh, but I guess that's why we love it because it's it's relentless, it's intense, it's it's hectic, it's busy, uh, and that's what makes football as uh, as exciting as it is to cover it in the way that both myself and Jacob cover it. And if you want to follow our guests between now and the end of the season, you can check them out. Their details are in the description below and do go and follow them. And I tell you what, guys, the first thing we have to do is look at that Premier League table from 12th to 20th. It's quite ridiculous. Mark, this is sometimes why we say this is the best league in the world. I think this season you're seeing absolutely why the Premier League is the best league in the world because there is something to play for in every single element uh, of the season. You know, there's a title race between the top two. There's a massive dogfight for the Champions League placings. You've got some exciting teams trying to fight to get into Europe, the likes of Brentford, Brighton uh, and Fulham, who are just promoted alongside Bournemouth from the Championship. And then the relegation scrap, which... It's a proper scrap because there are nine teams in it. And I don't think if someone was to hand you their cash to try and bet on the three teams to go down, anyone would be able to predict it at this stage because it changes game to game, week by week. One week you think that there's a side that are down and out and they're going to get relegated. Suddenly they win and the whole dynamic shifts. And, and that's why it's so brilliant this season. And, and hopefully this is a sign of things to come. We, we don't want it to be an obvious league where you know who's going to go up and go down, who's going to finish where they're going to finish. The whole point is that football is dramatic and the unexpected can happen. And I think that's what makes this season so special. Matt, as a promoted club like my team, Bournemouth, you're probably not shocked to be in this conversation. Maybe a few weeks ago, you thought you were getting out of it, but it's a different coverage for us podcasts and YouTube channels this season. And it's, it's a inconsistent week on week for us. Similar for you? Yeah. Forest have become one of these teams with real negative momentum uh, that have been sucked back into it. So a, a couple of weeks ago, I was feeling pretty comfortable and was really confident Forest would survive. And like Mark said, it changes week on week. And now, as we sit here right now, I'm not confident Forest will survive or I still have hope. So it's a real roller coaster. But like Mark was saying, with so many teams in the mix, just like one result changed everything. Looking at Leeds there now, if they'd lost that game to Wolves at the weekend, they might have felt they were dead and buried. So, you know, ask me again after the international break and the drama will be all over the place in a different way, I'm sure. 
Yeah, there's a few teams in there without a green tick at the moment in their form guide. And Jacob, we spoke about you having some really positive coverage to talk about last season. It's different coverage for you this season, trying to keep yourself uplifted. Yeah, I think after every game, you're trying to say, what on earth am I going to write about? Because it's another defeat <laughs> and, the, and the mood is as low as as it can be. But I think you just look at that table now and you think Slams have made a lot of mistakes this year. They've essentially written off five, six months of the season with two managers that really should have been there and yet they're only two points out you know from safety it's it's quite remarkable really and you think the run that Southampton have been on you think the mood and how despondent it's been it's been pretty terrible it's been a far cry from moaning about Scott Parker's 70% possession last year that that was a drop in an ocean um but considering you know Southampton have still got a chance and I think that's what they're, they're saying I think Ruben Sellers the coach has said for the last three weeks he wants as many teams in that dogfight as possible and if you look at that table now then it's almost half the league so it suits Southampton just fine. So I don't know quite where to start with our first topic which is about summarising your season up to this point as we go into an international break and do we start at the bottom? Let's work our way up <laughs> shall we Jacob? So Southampton have had 28 games currently bottom 23 points six wins 17 losses five draws under three head coaches. Summarise your season so far for Southampton. Yeah, it's not been boring at all. Um, I've, I've, you've always had something to write about uh, albeit quite negative. Uh, I think it's been a bit of a been a bit of a you know a complete mismatch of a, of a season really lots of players there's 30 players some have played some haven't it's been constantly changing they've been so busy in the transfer windows and the managers have been very very interesting you think you start with Ralph Harsno till who came into the season under pressure I think there was it's 50 50 really whether to sack him in the summer so their mood was already negative coming into the season Southampton have spent 120 million in the last two windows and for a club relative of Southampton's size that's that's massive and they've not really improved they've got a lot of young players but the squad's you know not not in balance and then Nathan Jones comes along and however fascinating and interesting it was for those on the outside it wasn't for Southampton fans uh, his press conferences were great his football was pretty pretty terrible and Ruben Sellers who's been there throughout the season who came in in the summer as Ralph Harsnes was number two has been quietly lurking in the background and a lot from what you hear and what I'm sure Mark's the same Ruben Sellers has probably been the, the shining light in Southampton's season and the players like him the staff like him and they've finally settled on a man that's been there throughout who's seen it all and they're now going to see if he can guide Southampton to safety I think in any other season they may be already be dead and buried but they've still got a chance and you see their record against the best teams in in the league and it's pretty good so hopefully it stands them in good stead for the weeks to come. Similar for Bournemouth, Mark. It's never sort of a boring season for us. It always seems to be a roller coaster. Something, something happens in a Bournemouth season that sort of swings from left to right. And currently this season, 27 games, currently 19th, 24 points, six wins, similar, 15 losses and six draws. How would you summarise the Cherry season that's not just had stuff on the pitch, it's also had stuff off the pitch, very much change? Absolutely. I think it's been a brilliant season, really, in all honesty, for Bournemouth. And I think you have to separate it into three phases. Um, this was a side where everyone was saying, virtually every single pundit, that Bournemouth would go down with the lowest points tally that the Premier League had ever seen. They were talking about a derby. They were talking about a Norwich. So the fact that they've got 24 points on the board and they're still very much in the thick of the relegation fight shows how much progress has been made and how well they've done. I think phase one was the Scott Parker era. It started off brilliantly with a 2-0 win against Aston Villa. Then they had three tricky games, the 9-0 at Liverpool, and then he was shown the door. That was kind of phase one. Phase two was the, the Gary O'Neill before the World Cup, unbeaten in six games, keeping clean sheets, playing really well, scoring goals. And Gary O'Neill gave, gave everyone a, a real lift and a belief that he, he could be the, the, the next kind of big thing. He could be a, a top-class head coach. Stumbled through to the World Cup. There was a big decision made whether to go with Marcelo Bielsa or to stick with Gary O'Neill. This was at the same time of the takeover as well. Uh, and essentially, Bill Foley had a heavy influence on the decision as to who should be the new head coach. He decided that Gary O'Neill had done a solid job. And I think he was right. He'd earned the opportunity to prove that he was good enough to keep Bournemouth in the Premier League. That decision was made at the start of the World Cup. And then phase three is the, the post-World Cup run, which has been pretty horrendous in terms of results. Performances have been 
fairly good at times. There's been a couple of black marks on the, the copybook. But, but generally, I think, you know, when you look at the fixtures, there's been some real positivity. Um, you know, they've been unlucky with VAR decisions. The 87th minute winner for Brighton away at the Amex, the, the, the last minute goal at the Emirates at Arsenal. Uh, and then most recently, the, the win at Wolves and, and the win um, against Liverpool are, are two big positives. But I think for me as a Bournemouth fan, the key thing for us this season, if we could still be in with a chance of staying in the Premier League on the final day of the season, for me, that would have been massively positive. You know, if you can take it right to the wire with a chance of surviving, then I would see that as, as positive. We've seen an investment in the summer of 70, in the, in the January of £75 million pounds with some young, exciting players. Um, you've seen the commitment from the new owners. That is always going to take time to, to come to fruition. So therefore, you know, this is the process, this is the, this is the start of a, a new era. Um, so if we go down to come back up again, no problem with that at all. We just need to see the right things being done. And I think we are. But of course, there's some big, big games to come and some big results are needed. But um, I think it's been a season of positivity. Apart from a, a couple of moments, I think there's a lot to be to be happy about as a Bournemouth fan. And still, Bournemouth are the only team in the Premier League not to get a penalty because Liverpool got one the other day. Moving on to Nottingham Forest, though, Matt, I mean, you must have been very excited to be back in the league after such a long time away. And I'm sure you wanted to clear that Derby County historic league number of 11 or whatever it was. But, you know, summarising your season, you spent a lot of money, brought a lot of players in. I've seen that you've let a player go out on loan to America because the squad's too big. How would you summarise it so far this season up to date? Yeah, I mean, Mark talks about a three-part season. I think it's been a four-part season for Forest in terms of the wild transfer business of the summer to to get 22 players in and reshape the squad at whirlwind pace. And Forest didn't really hit the ground running. They they had a really good win against West Ham, but then things went off the rails a little bit. And it looked like Steve Cooper would go, and then there was a real watershed moment where I think the fans rallied and kept him in a job, frankly, instead of someone like Rafa Benitez coming in. Uh, and he made the team much more pragmatic. They had a really good run either side of the World Cup. Uh, and fans were really optimistic after we beat Liverpool and beat Leicester. And they've fallen away since then, sadly. They've got a terrible away record. And they just it's put so much pressure on the home record that they, they've just fallen back a bit. And teams have chipped away and rallied and, and dragged us back into it. So overall, I think it's been a really good season to be outside the bottom three as a promoted team with, with so many new signings, so many injuries. It's been a big success at this point, but it feels like it's on a real knife edge now, Kirk. And when we speak about trying to get over the line, trying to stay in this league, it comes back to the guy that's leading the teams. And Jacob, there's been three head coaches for Southampton this season. It started with Ralph and he's done some, some, some really good things at Southampton in his time. And then obviously it moved over to Nathan Jones. And I'm not going to lie, Jacob, when I saw Nathan Jones going, I was actually quite happy about it. I thought it was a terrible appointment. And then obviously now it's Ruben Sellers. So the first question is, how did you feel overseeing those appointments and have they finally got it right for this run in? I think it's too early to say where they've got it right. But one thing they have got is buy in from the players. And that's not always been the case with the previous two managers. Um, essentially, Slamson have burnt two pre seasons in one season. The first one, Harsen has spent the whole of time working in Austria in this back five system. Slamson are going to be nice and defensive now. We're not going to press as much. And after the first opening day defeat to Tottenham away, 4 1. Uh, he went back to what he knew. So essentially, they wasted that preseason. Uh, it always felt like Ralph was coming to the end. He's been fantastic, but that energy can only last for so long. The players will only respond for so long, and it was approaching four years. And I think change was needed, probably needed in the summer, but Ralph had done such a good job. They thought they'd give up to the World Cup. And then when his position kind of become untenable, Nathan Jones came in. And for the life of me, I kept thinking, why did they go for Nathan Jones? And Rasmus Ankerson, who's the co-founder of Sport Republic, who's in charge of basically everything Slamton do, has admired Nathan Jones since his time at Luton from really 2016, 2017. And he liked him and he showed up really well on a data. What data that was, no one's quite sure because as data is very different to the human emotion and, and football on the pitch. Uh, and almost immediately, I think... You know, you took touch on it, Kirk. You thought it would be a disastrous appointment, and it pretty much looked like that straight away. Southampton didn't really do much. They had that break, that second break, that World Cup break, where again Jones decided to go for a back five system, and they went 
they were home to Brighton on Boxing Day, and Brighton played them off the park. 75% possession, Slamson couldn't get near. So for the next four or five games, I think he changed system six, 16 times within those games. Uh, they didn't know where they were coming or going, and it was pretty much of a mess, really. And obviously Jones, I think he lasted for six, 80 odd days, you know, with the World Cup in there, could have been shorter. And then Sellers came in because Jesse Marsh basically turned it down in the end. Uh, and he's got buy-in from the players. He's restored the best attributes of Ralph Harsen at all. And the players now really are playing for him. And I think it's a short-term fix. But the interesting thing about Sellers is that he's trying to install longer-term behaviours into this team. It's not just a case of, you know, if Roy Hodgson goes to Crystal Palace of being nice and direct, being nice and defensive. He's trying to get the team onto the front foot. So I think when Salampton play Forest in a couple of weeks' time, Bournemouth, you'll see a very different team than the one you saw under Nathan Jones. A lot more attacking, purposeful. And I think there, there are players there that can go on a run and they need the run of form yeah, straight away. Mark, I mean, we know what happened with Scott Parker, and I don't think we need to really go over that. I think <laughs> what happened, the way he sort of ended his time at Bournemouth, I think the club made the right decision. Now, Gary O'Neill came in to look after it, sort of buy time for the board, have a think about what the next stage was. And he, and he had a pretty good interim spell. He had that unbeaten six-game run, as you said. I don't think, Mark, it was completely flawless. I think there were mistakes in there. There were performances against Southampton. The Brentford game wasn't very attractive to watch. But this is Gary O'Neill has never been at this level before, and he's learning, and he was learning. And when you get to the World Cup off the back of that Everton result, do you think the club had a really good opportunity to maybe do something they've never done before? Um, because the takeover, the money we knew we were going to have in January. For, my first question is, do you think that they went for Bielsa? Do you think that might come back and bite, potentially? You'll never know. You'll never know, will you? You know, they could have brought Marcelo Bielsa in and he could have struggled to um, get his philosophy into that group of players. They could have struggled to adapt to what he wanted them to do. And Bournemouth could be sat bottom of the Premier League now with Marcelo Bielsa as their manager. Um, it's 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 well it's a hypothetical question. Really. You, you, you'll just never know. Um, what happened in that that space of time is that Richard Hughes, the sporting director, the chief exec Neil Blake, uh, and members of the board were charged with finding potentially a manager that could take the team on for the start of the World Cup and the second phase of the season. And their search came across who they thought at the time was the best manager, the best appointment they could make which was Marcelo Bielsa. It was then essentially left to the new owner, Bill Foley, to decide, do you want to stick with the man that had done a good, solid job, the man that had been coaching for that group that group of players for some time uh, and had a, a very solid record as caretaker manager? Um, or did they want to go down a different path, a point in the, for, you know, in the club's history, the first ever foreign manager in Marcelo Bielsa, someone that would take full control, someone that would be very expensive, someone that would have his own philosophy in the transfer market and the club would lose that element of control that they've had and that kind of a strategy uh, and philosophy that they've been trying to put into the football club and suddenly they scrap it all and put someone else in who, who comes in with a different way of doing things. And Bill Foley ultimately decided that the right thing to do was to stick with Gary O'Neill, which I don't think there would have been too many people um, that, that completely disagreed with that, particularly having seen the way he'd worked with the, with the group. Obviously, results since the World Cup haven't been great, and that's the problem, but results and performances are two very different things. If Bournemouth fans think that they've got the right to beat Liverpool and Man City and Brighton um, at any side of the Premier League, they haven't. Uh, particularly with the way they started the campaign and the lack of investment under the previous owner, not because of he, the fact he didn't invest in the whole time that he owned the club. He did a lot. But whilst the transition of takeover was happening, he wasn't going to spend loads more money in the market in case the takeover fell through. So um, that was kind of the, the situation as I understood it. It was a tough call. I think they, they deliberated for a number of days over what they wanted to do and who they thought was the right man. And eventually, after a, a few kind of sleepless nights, they decided to stick with Gary. Now, at the end of the season, we'll know whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. If Gary O'Neill keeps Bournemouth in the Premier League, it was a master stroke. If they get relegated, then they'll probably look back and say, we probably should have made a change. We should have given it to someone else. Um, but I think Gary would be perfectly poised in the right place should Bournemouth get relegated to take the team back up from the champ. So, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of an interesting one, really. But, you know, ultimately, you'll never know what would have happened if they'd gone in a different direction. It's definitely splitting the fan base, of course. And I think that there are fans of Bournemouth fans that, that 
are happy with the O'Neill appointment. It's something we've done, something we've done before and heart on their sleeve. And then there's the other fans that just want that experienced head, someone that's been around the block, got their stripes and just to sort of nurture these players because the squad's there now, Mark, you covered it throughout Sky Sports. There's no sort of excuses now to say we haven't got pace and ability and trickery and skill. It's in that squad now. So he's got the squad, Gary O'Neill, to keep us up in the Premier League. Yeah, definitely. I think he's got um, an excellent squad on paper with a, a really good degree of experience. You know, players that have played in the Premier League, players that have played in the Championship. He's got kind of a bit of raw energy um, and a fearlessness from some of the signings that came in in January. Um, so I think he's got a nice balance. I think the, all, the other thing that's really important to point out as well, when you look at our recent bad run... How many of Gary O'Neill's best players, how many of his starting 11 have actually been available for him? When you haven't got the likes of Tavernier, who's been Bournemouth's arguably the best player this season, or you've not got Philip Billing, you've not got your, your first choice centre-half pairing, you've had goalkeeper issues, you've had, you know, wide men that haven't been able to create chances and score goals. And you looked at the bench and you've got young kids on the bench that have never played anywhere near a first team appearance in their life, but they are the options that Gary O'Neill has to turn to. You have to look back and take a, a perspective on the bigger picture and say, well, what else is he expected to do? Is he really expected to get results in the Premier League when the squad's been so decimated by injuries? Um, the answer is no. So I think there needs to be a little bit of realism from the Bournemouth fans that when they look back over those results, arguably only that the Crystal Palace match would be seen as a real disappointment in terms of performance. But when you look at the other games, I think Bournemouth have always been competitive. Aston Villa aside, um, I think they've, they've really kind of shown that they can compete at this level. They've given everyone a good game. Uh, they, you know, they've caused a couple of upsets. And I think what you can see in this side is a team that's capable of staying in the Premier League. Uh, and that's the most important thing. J just be competitive. That's all you ever ask for from a Bournemouth side. And the fact they've got this sort of young hunger and a little bit of uh, excitement and buzz about them at the moment, thanks to the new players... I think we're going into this last 10, 11 games of the season with a real belief that we can stay up. Um, and if you'd spoke to Bournemouth fans six games ago, they'd have said no chance. Whereas now, I think collectively, everyone believes that there's there's something there special that, that could mean Premier League survival. Now, Matt, you've only got to talk about one manager because he's been there from the start. He got you promoted. Well, I say he's been there from the start. There was a Leicester game when it was a little bit touch and go and there were fans thinking that maybe that was his last game as manager. But the owner of Nottingham Forest decided to sort of give him a new contract. And it looked like it's not a bad decision in the end. You're not in the relegation zone as we speak. Your away form's a little bit dodgy, as we know. And I know you've lost recently, but under Steve Cooper, I get the feeling that Forest fans see him as quite, quite a legend at the club. Oh, yeah. He's got the keys to the city, definitely. Uh, you know, even under recent wobbles, Forrest would be nowhere near the Premier League without Steve Cooper. When you look at where they were when he took over bottom of the championship, he, he's transformed the whole football club. And I don't think it's a very small minority who would be questioning him at this moment. I'm sure, it's like, you know, every manager makes mistakes, as you referenced O'Neill there and um, obviously Nathan Jones from Jacob's point of view. No manager's bulletproof, but he's done a magnificent job and he's been very adaptable throughout the season. You know, they started with a midfield two and it was very open. They went to a three and been much more pragmatic. And as Mark said, with injuries, Forrest, you know, they lost both their centre halves in the same move in the same minute of a game at Fulham. You know, you don't get that normally. So they've had a lot thrown at them. Their best striker has been injured in Tyro one year. Their best midfielder in Ryan Yates has missed a big chunk of the season all at the same time. Dean Henderson blew up his groin taking a goal kick. Just a series of like freak incidents. Obviously, the owner backed him, backed Cooper massively by going out and getting Kaylon Navas from PSG. But there's, there's been a lot of disruption. Uh, and as we sit here now, you, you know, all our clubs are in a, a position where they'll, they'll feel like they can stay up. And as a Forest fan at the start of the season, I think it's always been the belief that 17th is everything. And that's still very much possible, although I'm sure we'll talk about run-ins and upcoming games. Yeah. Obviously, we've got some very tricky games to come, but it'd be, I, I, I think it'd be very foolish to for uh, you know any fan of the football club or other football clubs to rule them out at this stage, certainly. I think yeah, we... with Nottingham Forest, Matt, and you might disagree with me here, the best signing they've made, despite the 25, 26, 27 players they've signed in the two windows, 
is Steve Cooper. And I think if you just look at what he's achieved and what he's done, even if they were to come down, if Steve Cooper is that manager in the championship, you could almost bet your house that they would come straight back up. And that's sometimes what football clubs need to remember. It's not just about one season. It's about a project and a process. You just have to look at Arsenal now or even Pep Guardiola at Man City. He didn't win anything in his first season, but it's the, the foundations to build on and to create a culture and a DNA at the football club. And you're definitely seeing that with Steve Cooper. Yeah, and to do that with 22 new signings as well, you know, players arriving who don't necessarily speak the language, who don't know each other in the dressing room, obviously don't know the country, to create and foster a team spirit and a tactical plan, it, you know, it's it's not the job that any manager would want, really. It was the job he was given. He's done the very best he can, I think. They Early in the season, I think by Cooper's own admission, there was a stage like the Leicester game, we'll keep referencing, they didn't look like a team. But since then, they, they, they have looked like a team. And I think January might have altered that a bit. They've gone for experience in Chris Wood and John Joe Shelby and Andre Ayew. And it hasn't worked yet. They're kind of rediscovering their their identity around injury. But to be in this position with a really strong shout of staying up at this stage is still a fantastic achievement for sure. Now, I don't expect stats to be amazing because all of these teams are down the bottom of the league, Jacob. But when you look at potential strengths for Southampton to stay up, of course, I don't want Southampton to stay up. But if you're talking about Southampton to stay up, I'm going to look at players like James Ward-Prowse and he's clearly striking the ball away for Southampton in the numbers of goals. Assists are a little bit low for me for Southampton. Where are those strengths between now and the final 10 games in that squad? Yeah, the issue has been Slampton's lack of goals, really, from open play. I, I think I made a joke a few weeks ago that Slampton should start playing for James Ward Prowse free kicks because they don't really master anything in open play. And I think, but obviously, you, 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 they play Tottenham on Saturday. And I think that's when it changed. So I think what they're looking for now is that they think, right, Ruben Sellers, I mentioned it earlier, he's trying to install longer term behaviour. So the, one of the things that he wants to do is he wants Slampton to play out from the back under Nathan Jones and under Ralph Harsons. Well, before that, they were the most direct team. Uh, in the Premier League for goal kicks. They went long every time, just by having a 5 foot 10 inch target man in Che Adams. Uh, but now Ruben Sellis is trying to play out from the back a little bit more. Uh, I think R Romeo Lavia is the key player to this. He's going to cost a lot of money. He's the best Salamson player I've seen since Virgil van Dijk. He transforms that team. He receives the ball under pressure from the goal kick, from centre-backs, and he plays through the thirds. And that's how Salamson are trying to generate attacks now. Uh, it's taken a while because obviously Sellers has had enough time. He's come straight in. But I think you're looking at the last couple of games, he's sure up the defence, although obviously Tottenham had a few caveats because the two starting centre-backs went off injured in the first half. And now he's trying to slowly and steadily improve the attack. Uh, but still, that nagging feeling is that they are relying on James Will prowse he, he is the clutch player. And uh, if you saw that penalty in that 90th minute against Spurs, you just see how emphatic it was. And he's done that all season. He's bailed Southampton out of key, of key moments in, in critical games. Everton away scores free kick it's it's phenomenal really and he you know he does probably does deserve to move on at the end of the season but whilst you have James Will Prowse you have a chance and I'm sure when you rock up to St Mary's in however many weeks and you see Slampton on the edge of the box you're praying that no one dives in and commits a foul because every time that someone commits a foul you hear that hush from the opposition fans because you know what's coming and I think Slampton fans know that their best chance of staying up is James Will Prowse and predominantly his free kicks too. Uh, not in the England squad either is he? No, uh, I don't want to comment on that. I think it's an absolute shambles. But... Um... Oh, so you did comment on that. It's an absolute <laughs> I'll leave it, Mark. Well. I'll leave it. <laughs> What's the Achilles heel then, Jacob? What's going to cost Southampton their position in the Premier League? Ultimately, it's what's got, gone before. They've made so many mistakes. And in any other season, like I said earlier, they would be down. You can't have two managers that don't really belong there. The mood within the camp has been so ho hollow, so bad, so negative. And, you know, this ownership are embarking or entrenching their first full season and they've made a lot of mistakes in investment. They've signed 15 players in two windows, not quite Nottingham Forest numbers, but a lot for Southampton and most of them have been misses and hits and I think that's probably what's going to happen. You know, if they go down, it won't be the fault of Ruben Sellers or the current backroom team. It'll be what's gone before. Uh, it's just whether they've got enough now to resurrect it with, you know, 10 or 11 games to go. Mark, looking at Bournemouth's strengths, and I know I could comfortably reel off a few. I think the, the the players that have come in showed some really 
good talent. Utara's got three assists already. I think Rothwell's made a contribution recently. Neto is the new captain. Jack Stevens has come from Southampton and been really strong. And his experience alongside Senesi, they've had a really good blend in partnership. And would and, and it's even more hard to believe that they've kept out our player of the season up to the World Cup in Chris Meppham, in my opinion. Tavernier, we know, was one of the best dribblers in the league before he got injured. But I do want to talk about Philip Billing. Now, this is a player that had a turbulent career at the start. Then he excelled in the championship, 10 goals, 10 assists last season, kicked on. He's top goal scorer for Bournemouth. And he's one of the reasons we're still in and around it at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. I think everyone will agree if Philip Billing could find a level of consistency about his game, he would be playing for a top six side. There's no question about it. When Bournemouth took him from Huddersfield, there were a lot of big clubs watching him as well, but they just didn't think that he could do it consistently enough and generate those kind of numbers uh, week in, week out. And, and that's proven to be the case. You know, he's, he's had moments of pure brilliance where he can control a game, his, his physical presence brings something different. He can score goals, he can make assists, he can be an aerial threat, he's got the ability to, to play uh, and he brings so many clever attribu attributes to, to Bournemouth's attacking game that, you, you know, you look at him some weeks and think, geez, how, how is he still at Bournemouth? But unfortunately for, for, for Philip Billing and for us, he just doesn't do it consistently enough and that's the problem. But I think he's always the type of player that can just bring up a little piece of magic at some stage in a match you know that he's always going to be in and around the box uh, and he's a constant threat and he has the ability to score goals or, or assist goals. So, yeah, Philip Billing would, would definitely be a, a key player for Bournemouth between now and the end of the season. But I actually think it's it's Hamad Traore and yeah. uh, Dongo Watara. They're the two kind of enigmas for Bournemouth. The, they're still very unknown. They have a no-fear kind of attitude about them. And they're two players that I think they, you know, they're, they're kind of edge-of-the-seat players. They get fans off off the off the chairs they get people onto their feet they can make things happen in the blink of an eye and when you're in a relegation battle like Bournemouth are you need those kind of players that just come up with a piece of magic because you know most of the time you're going to have backs to the wall it's going to be tough but you're going to need an outlet you're going to need someone that can take you up the pitch you're going to need someone that that can provide that creative spark and I think those two with a little bit of experience from Billing could be the the, the key three players for Bournemouth in this final part of the season. Now, Mark, I've got an opinion on where I think it might go wrong for Bournemouth if we don't stay up in two areas. I think we've had too many inconsistent performances and I think that's when we've actually tried to come away from our DNA and what we do best and we've tried to overthink the fixture, try to maybe be hard to beat and then the game's over at half-time. So I think when we play to our strengths and we actually try and go for it in games like we did against Liverpool, we can give pretty much any side a game. doesn't mean we'll win, but we'll give them a game and we'll be competitive. The other reason I think we might struggle to stay up is if we don't find Dom Solanke shooting boots. This is a guy that's become the main man since Callum Wilson left. He got 15 championship goals in his first season, 29 in his second. And I think this was the time for him to shine and prove to everyone that he could do it in the Premier League. I think he had a, a start to the season where he's played out of position under Scott Parker. And then he's had a few injury spells as well. Three goals this season is not enough for me to keep Bournemouth in this league. And, and Dom needs to find those shooting boots and we're going to need to help him. We're going to need to create chances. It's the classic championship striker, Premier League striker debate, isn't it? You seem to have it every single year. I think, Jacob, you've got probably a couple of really good quality championship strikers, Armstrong, Shea Adams. As soon as they transition to the top flight, it goes wrong and they, and they can't seem to find the form. And unfortunately, that's been the case with Dom Solanke. He's always been a player that I've always rated really highly. He's always given everything to Bournemouth. He's never been a problem off the pitch. He always gives 100%. In the Championship, he looks like a, a menace and a goal machine. In the Premier League, it's not quite the same. And only really he can answer the question as to why he's not been able to transition those goals from the second tier to the Premier League. Um, but you're right. He needs to come up with a couple of goals between now and the end of the season. If he scores you know, just the two, two more goals in the Premier League campaign but they happen to be in games where Bournemouth win by one goal, then that would be, you know, worth its weight in gold. Um, but yeah, it has been a disappointment in terms of the numbers. He's led the line well, he's worked hard, he's been in and out of the side because of injury. But now this is the time uh, where he's got to really step up, like, for example, Keith Moore did. 
you know, Keith and Moore will always be remembered by Bournemouth fans for that heroic moment um, midweek against Forest that got Bournemouth promoted. Sorry, Matt, to take you back to that moment. But but that, yeah, that one that goal, that one <laughs> goal, that one moment was iconic and will always be a part of Bournemouth folklore. And I think if Dom Solanke can come up with a moment like that this season, he will be written into the history books as well. And the lack of goals will be forgotten about if he can get one key moment in a match. And, and I think that's what we need to focus on with him. Just, you know, just keep doing your thing. Relax. Don't worry about your numbers. Just go and be that striker we need in the heat of the battle, in that defining moment and keep this side in the Premier League. Don't apologise to Matt, because I've heard Forest fans, they were glad that that happened because they got a day out at Wembley. And while Matt thinks exactly. about... I was strength... there as well at Wembley and I enjoyed it as well. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> while Matt thinks about his strengths and weaknesses for Nottingham Forest and how they're going to stay up, Jacob, it is fair to me for me to ask you about Dom Solanke because you had a close eye on him last season, watching him every single game. Are you surprised he's only got three goals this season? I am, but I'm also quite surprised that the, I've seen a few comments from Bournemouth fans on Twitter about you know the f- a few issues because he's only scored three goals. But I think you've got to look at his all-round play and how important he is to this Bournemouth team. I still watch him now and I still think he's he's crucial. You know, his running statistics were off the chart last year. I'm not sure if it's the same this year, but I imagine it is. His link-up play, his intelligence is fantastic. And you've got to remember, he's not this out-and-out number nine. He's not a Mitrovic who stands in the box and and wins headers and he's that bully. He links the play. He's that excellent false nine. He combines really, really well. He brings other players into play. One of the reasons why perhaps Philip Billings been doing so well, especially in the championship, he them two had a fantastic relationship. And, you know, you saw against Liverpool, I, I watched the game. You, you, he drops in and Watara drives in behind the defence. Mm. So I think it's all obviously goals is the metric that everyone measures them on. But I think his overall play and his contribution to that team is, is far, far more significant than goals itself. So, Matt, over to you for your strengths and weaknesses for Nottingham Forest. Now, you spoke about Brennan Johnson at the start of the season when we had a debate like this, and he does seem to be the man that's helping Steve Cooper and this team score goals. Yeah, where's where's the positive performances come from you this season? What players are shining? It was interesting hearing you guys talk about Solanke and that bridging that gap from Championship to Premier League, and Brennan's certainly done that. He got off to a a rocky start where I think it was a, a bit of uh, a, a, a culture shock, maybe if that's the right term. He'd gone from League One to the Championships, the Premier League in back-to-back seasons. So it was a huge step up. But since just before the World Cup and certainly after that experience with Wales, he, he's been unbelievable. And it was a great relief to see him not miss a game after he went off injured at Tottenham with a groin problem. So, so much hangs on him. And you're talking about... Um, the winger at Bournemouth at Watara, is it that X Factor player and and obviously Ward Price and a different style of player. That's someone who's got that magic in their boots and Brennan's got it and he's got this link up with Morgan Gibbs White that has been so pivotal in games and they've lost that a little bit in the last few matches and it's cost them. But if they can rediscover that, they've got every chance of staying up. So those are the probably the two players and the third one will be Ryan Yates, who's the heartbeat of the team in midfield, who has also made the step up from the championship really well, which is interesting with so many signings that it's players from the championship, for, you know, with Morgan playing with Sheffield United last season. They're the three stars of the show that have come in and done the business for us. I like Morgan Gibbs White as well. I remember we got a very, very good draw at Bramall Lane last season and a great save from Mark Travers, as Jacob will probably remember. But Morgan Gibbs White is such a good player. I did think the money was a lot, but. It, I don't think it is in 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 it nowadays, and, and Mark will know more about transfer fees and whether they're relevant or not. Someone Do you know that Bournemouth nearly signed Morgan Gibbs White Cup. Wow! Tell me more, although it well, didn't happen. It, it was it was the year he went on loan to Sheffield United, um, and um, he got presented as as being available, um, but that was a position that Bournemouth had filled with a number of players, and it just would have been unwise to sign another player. Um, but um, yeah, there was there was a half a chance that, that he could have gone to Bournemouth, but it just happened too late in the window and he ended up going to Sheffield United. So there you talk, go. Talk about deflating me, Mark, because that would have been <laughs> an absolute signing. But I do look at some of these players we got and think, how are we going to fit them all in when they're fit? Matt, talking about your problems that are going to cost you potential, your status in the Premier League. I mean, I don't know much about what Jesse Lingard's done this season, but he was a player that come in, was meant to blast you to good things. And I, I haven't seen much, I'm not going to lie. But is it your away form that's probably going to really hurt, hurt, hurt your status in this league? 
Yeah, I mean, so Jesse hasn't really been a factor in our season, sadly, because you know, he's he's missed a lot of games through injury, and then he can't get in the team at the moment. I think he's. It's, I'll come off the question about Wheaton in a minute. He's been a bit unlucky. You know, he was ill after the World Cup, after he'd been in good form going into the tournament. So it would be a false narrative to say he's been a total failure, but I couldn't sit here and say he's been a, any kind of success either. Um, just on, yeah, weaknesses. I mean, the away record, as you say, is absolutely horrendous. They they beat Southampton at St. Mary's and I think the timing was right there. It looked like a championship game and Southampton thought they were a team fighting relegation from the championship with the kind of performance they put up in that game. So I think we were lucky on that night to catch Southampton at one of their lowest ebbs, although Jacob might say there were many lower ebbs than that. But <laughs> It's uh, been a few, Matt. <laughs> but yeah, they, they, you know, the away form is a real problem. And the second one, it's kind of stating the obvious, but so many avoidable goals. They've given away three penalties in the last three games that have been really, you know, mind-numbing areas. You saw Nia Kate on Friday. He's trying to spike a volleyball in the 94th minute and yeah. Joe Worrell at Spurs. And they gifted West Ham a lot of goals in the succession. And they were doing that earlier in the season, blowing up in games in 10-minute spells, which they had cut out. So... In short, if they can stop avoidable errors and get back to being defensively solid and just grind out one away win and an away draw and a couple of home wins, you know, all our clubs only probably think they need three wins and a draw. Yeah. So, you know, get back to basics and start doing things right, I think is a, a really important thing going into the final weeks. I think what's been really interesting about this league and this season, I mean, apart from probably Palace, who haven't had anything to celebrate in 2023, it's like up and down. One week, you're like on cloud nine, you beat Liverpool. Next week, you see Forrest throw it, throw it away against Newcastle. Then you see your own team lose 3 0 at Villa Park. Then Southampton come back from 3 1 down to draw 3 3. And you're just up and down, up and down. And I don't think it's going to change between now and the end of the season. We are going to try and do a table predictor in a minute, guys, to just see what we think will happen between now and the end of the season. But Jacob, have a look at Southampton's final 10 games. Give me your opinion on those. You've got West Ham away, City at home, Crystal Palace home, Arsenal away, Bournemouth home, Newcastle away, Forest away, Fulham home, Brighton away, Liverpool home. You are on 23 points. Well, Southampton are currently 20th. Hmm. It's a bit of an odd one because you think every other game, there's a, t- there's a really tough team in there. And then the other other uh, on the flip side of it you think there's other games that you think are really winnable you know you go from West Ham you, you're not in great form and then you go to Man City then you go back to Crystal Palace and it kind of continues after that as well I think for me the home record is is the issue Sam's got the worst home record in, in the league uh, they've had a lot of defeats a lot of low points I think not in Forest I don't know if you can believe this Matt it's not the worst defeat at home this season that came a couple of weeks later when Slampton had an extra man for over an hour one nil up and they somehow lost 2-1 to Wolves um, so those type of defeats have happened throughout the season and I think you look at those two home games next Crystal Palace and Bournemouth and you think you really need to pick up four to six points probably six points ideally to to really get out of it uh, and it's, it's going to be difficult as long as you, when you go to away to Arsenal and you play Liverpool and you play Man City, that these aren't you know confident damages really. Uh, but Southampton tend to play better. I'm, I'm sure you, I've heard you say it as well, Kirk. Southampton tend to play better against the bigger teams. They've yeah. played Chelsea, they've played United, and they've played Tottenham in the last four weeks, and they've not lost, not lost any of them. Uh, but then obviously you play against Leeds, you play against Brentford, and you lose. So I think. Sounds have probably got a good run of games, good balance run of games, but it's all about at home form and dealing with the pressure because fans under pressure, there's an anxiety around St Mary's and this team is the youngest in the league and it's the first time in a relegation dogfight. I'm quite sad. I've been trying to predict what each team's going to do and I'm trying to get Bournemouth to a certain amount of points, which we're going to speak about in a moment. And Mark, I'm looking at those Bournemouth fixtures and I'm thinking... We can beat Fulham with no Mitrovic and William and a manager. We then got Brighton at home. I think we can probably beat a, an inconsistent Leicester away. Tottenham, we never do well at. West Ham at home and not the same West Ham of previous seasons. Southampton away, we owe them one. Leeds at home, we owe them one. Chelsea at home's a win. You know that, Mark. Crystal Palace away. <laughs> Man United at home. I tell you what I don't want to do, Mark, is go to Everton and need to get something in against the Sean Dyche side at Goodison Park. Yeah, I think that final game of the season could be defining. Um, but I'm looking at that running and I'm I'm thinking, well, there's games that you you know are going to be tough. But Bournemouth, you know, potentially could could beat Fulham, could beat Leicester. They could pick up a point against Tottenham, Brighton, West Ham. 
you know, Southampton win, lose or draw, draw will be what it is. But but Leeds at home, you know, the Palace away game, there's matches there where they can pick up three points. Um, and, and if Bournemouth picked up, you know, sort of 10, 11 points, 12 points out of those games, you could you could see that being feasible. Um, I think based on those, I think Bournemouth's fixture is probably slightly better than, than Southampton's. Uh, and you'd probably be a little bit more comfortable looking, you know, from Bournemouth's perspective at the, the situation with a, a little bit more on the board and uh, and just those fixtures. But I just, again, I say the same thing. I've been saying it for weeks and months. If Bournemouth go into that Everton game knowing that a win could keep them in the Premier League, then that would be a fantastic achievement. I, I genuinely believe that. You know, this is this was always going to be a tough season. This wasn't the side that got promoted in 2015 with Eddie Howe as the manager. Um, this is a different group. This is a new era. This is a new owner. This is a total setup, And um, this is the start of a process. And the most important thing is if we go down, which we could do, that we are top of the league next year. We do a Burnley and you come straight back up again. And I think that's, that's great. If we have a year of championship football where we win, you know, 30 games out of 46 and play some great football and look really good and some goals and see these young players develop. When they come up the following season, they'll be much better equipped to compete in the Premier League. And I think that's the most important thing. I think we'll be better positioned in the championship this time round as well. I do agree, especially with that new infrastructure coming with the training ground and these players that are on long contracts, Sabani as well. We should have a very good squad if the worst happens. Now, Matt, I think you beat Leeds a few weeks ago and I think Forest fans thought, it's OK, we're not getting relegated, but you are back in this conversation and it's Wolves at home, Leeds away, Villa away, Manchester United at home, Liverpool away, Brighton at home, Brentford away, Southampton at home, Chelsea away, Arsenal home and Crystal Palace away. Oh. How do you feel about those remaining fixtures? Yeah, it's a tougher run in than the other teams, isn't it? I mean... <laughs> There's a couple of games that leap off the page. Wolves at home, Southampton at home. Forest home record's been great. They've only lost that one game since September. And then, you know, I wouldn't rule out again something against Manchester United at home. Obviously, a win would be difficult, but points. It's just the away form's just so chaotic um, that it makes you really nervous. So the feeling is they need three home three wins and you kind of look at okay Wolves Southampton Brighton can they win those games it's going to be very difficult I do think they've got a hard run in they just need to keep doing what they've been doing at home they they got a point against Man City and they got a point against Chelsea and they should have won that game they beat Liverpool they've given everyone a game at home keep that up find a couple of results away from home and they're right. They're right in it. Other teams have got hard run-ins as well. Ironically, it's, you know, I was looking earlier. Southampton, and Bournemouth, especially Bournemouth, uh, have got one of the best run-ins. Of, Palace have got a good run-in as well. But actually, they're the team I'd worry about most at the moment if I was one of their fans. So, I don't think the fixtures mean everything. But I do fully accept that Forest have got a, a very difficult set of games there in the, the final weeks of the season. Yeah, there's other guys on the channel as well that think West Ham's running is pretty difficult as well. So this is going to be a tough one to call. Please do subscribe to the channel. We hope you're enjoying this video because Mark, Jacob and Matt are not going to sit on the fence in a moment. They're going to predict what they think will happen between now and the end of the season. Well, that's what I'm hoping. They might sit on the fence. I'm hoping they won't. Also hit this, uh, hit the like button on this video. We'll much appreciate it. I want to help this video grow in YouTube. Right, guys, I've been thinking about this for about a month. I have come to the conclusion a month ago that I think 35 points could do it. It's been enough in five of the last seven seasons. Mark, before we go into those predictions, who you think will go down, whether you think Bournemouth will stay up, how many points do you think you need minimum to stay in the Premier League this season? Oh, I haven't done as much analysis um, and as as much research as you clearly have, uh, have done. I, it's difficult to, to tell at this stage. You'd need to sit down with charts and um, look at all the fixtures and, and try and plot things out as to how many points you'll need. I think, you know, I, I, you know, if you get to 35 points, 36 points, I think you'll be there or thereabouts. The, the, the thing that, that's great about this season, because there's nine teams in that bottom relegation scrap, not every single side is going to pick up three points every week, you know, and, and there's a lot of games where you're playing against teams that are also in the fight as well. So that will affect it. But you could, you could the great thing about it, you can make an argument every single side stay up 
And you can also have an argument for every single side to go down. And there are so many other factors at play here as well. Um, you know, you talk about West Ham there, you know, they're in the Europa, Europa Conference League. I yeah. think if they hadn't been as effective in this competition as they have been, David Moyes would have been sacked, you know, a couple of months back. But that's been the one shining light of their season. But suddenly when they're playing on a Thursday night and then they've got a, a game and they've got travelling and they've got jet lag or whatever and they're coming back into the UK and they've got one training session and then they've got to play on a Sunday, that will have massively affect their their squad. Um you know, as I say, Southampton suddenly looked like a different side. Everton's got Sean Dyche and he's, he's worth five or six points to them. No question about that. The Forest away form, um, but they've got players that could be match winners on their day. Crystal Palace uh, are really struggling. Won a game in 2023. But when you've got Wilfred Zaha on your side, he's a player that will win you a match on his own. Um, you know, Leicester could be one of those teams that sleepwalk into it. Leeds look a little bit uncertain. Um, I, I just that's the, the problem with this and that's, this is why we love it this is why we're gripped to it this is why yeah. we're talking about it now and we're going to be you know watching every move and every moment between now and that last kick of the, the season because this is probably the best relegation battle we've ever seen in the Premier League because genuinely there are nine teams that could find themselves in the championship uh, and there'll be one or two huge clubs that don't expect to be in the second tier of English football will find themselves lining up against Sheffield Wednesday Plymouth or Ipswich next season more the merrier, I say. More the merrier, but I think it is the nine. Matt, 35, is that going to be enough? Yeah, I think so. Like Mark said, there's so many teams down the bottom that no one's going to win enough games to get to 40 points, I don't, I don't think. I think everyone's going to pick points off each other. I think 35, 36, something like that. It just means that, I think that means for everyone, it's going to be a very tense last day. And for me, going to Crystal Palace on the last day with this away record would make me very nervous. But I think if you offer me the chance of going there and needing a point or a win right now, I'd certainly take it for Forrest. Yeah, I think I'm just trying to get to a target, Jacob, that looks realistic for Bournemouth. Does 35 do it? I think so. Uh, I think if you ask in Southampton, they take 35 points. Now. <laughs> They've played, played 28 games, got only got 23 points. Uh, I think 35, yeah, I think you're looking at there or thereabouts. Like Mark said, uh, you know, ideally you'd probably want to be like 37, 38 March just have you give yourself a cushion, but yeah, everyone's going to take points out of me from each other. And you know, like Southampton say, like Ruben Sir say, they want this to be a dog fight, they want to keep as many teams as possible for as long as they can in that in that fight for survival. Right, this is a Bournemouth channel, so be very careful what you're going <laughs> to say. But we are going to have some predictions. I'll bring the league table up in a minute so you can just gauge again where the teams are. First question, Jacob, do Southampton stay up before you give me your free relegated teams? No, they don't. Oh, that is brave. And there might be Southampton fans watching this. Right, let's put let's put Jacob straight in the firing line, shall we? Let's take yeah. the banner off the screen. Right, Jacob, who's your three teams to go down this season? Yeah, considering Southampton have been bottom of the table since November, uh, I think I think they'll probably stay there. I, I I'm hoping that doesn't come true, but I think this has been too many mistakes. Like I've said, that you know, for Southampton to get out out of it I'm going to keep Bournemouth where they are I think I, I said this the other day I think Bournemouth are probably more set up than Southampton to stay out I think they've got really good pace they've got they're good on transition but I do worry about those games where they're play, supposed to be playing the teams that they're expected to beat because they've got to break down low blocks and you see the other day on the weekend they struggle with it at points so I think they'll stay down they'll down there and I'm sadly going to say Nottingham Forest as well so I think all three of us will be will, won't be very he's happy done us all, this guys. Season. Yeah. he's done us all <laughs> we've had a, we've all had a target on us tonight <laughs> <laughs> so you've gone for Southampton Bournemouth and Nottingham Forest uh let's come to you Matt firstly do Nottingham Forest stay up uh it's 50 50. I mean, the bookies and opt to have it at 50 50, don't they? And a couple of weeks, yeah, even a week ago, it was like a 20% chance. In my, my heart says mm. yes, and the head's really wavering. It's a bit like schizophrenic about it. It's difficult to say. I mean, Hop I'll say yes. I'm going to say yes, team. they'll stay up because they've got enough at home. And they've. I think they've got something both your teams don't have in a goal scorer and a bit of a magician in Brennan Johnson that might be. The difference. I can't. I, I love War Price, but I can't see him banging in quite enough goals. And I think Bournemouth, unless Solanke does something, they're struggling. So I think Forest have got that X factor that gives me a bit of faith still. 
So you're edging your club out of that relegation zone. What's the three teams you think will go down? Yeah, I think Southampton probably got too much to do and their recruitment in the summer, bringing in a lot of young players, a lot of good young talented players, but a lack of Premier League experience is probably not going to help them. And I think they seem to have some problems at centre-half with injuries at the moment, unless um, that's not the case. I saw players went off. So I do think Southampton have got too much to do. And I do think Bournemouth probably are just lacking uh, that 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 goal scorer, like I said, that difference maker. Unless Watara is a real like a magician that uh, has a bit more than promise, a bit more of an end product, he'd have to do something special that makes me think Bournemouth are probably are struggling, but really well set to come back up. Better set than um, Forest probably if Forest do go down. I think that puts Bournemouth in really good stead. And the third team, I just look at the fixtures and uh, I think Wolves have got a really tough run in. If Wolves lose to Forest, I think they've got Man U away, Arsenal away, Everton at home in the last three games. And I felt all along uh, that they'd be fine. A lot of my friends are Wolves fans. I grew up in that area and they, they've not been worried until just now. And I think they could get dragged into it and Palace could get dragged into it. I think Leicester will be fine. I think Everton will probably be all right with Sean Dyche and Leeds probably got just enough. So I think the third team, although it looks unlikely at the moment, I'll I'll go Palace without a manager. That appointment goes wrong. They make a Nathan Jones-style gap. I think they, they could be the ones that, you know, have not been in there all season. And that's a different thing, isn't it? They've been sucked into it and that mentality of player... But how it affects them, you know, I, I'd be worried if I was a Palace fan right now. Yeah, that would be some free fall. And I've done this on purpose, Mark, because we're the <laughs> underdog. We always are. And over to you, before you give me the three teams, the Bournemouth stay up this season. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, yeah, yeah, I think they can. I think, I think you look at the performances against Arsenal and the performance against Liverpool they've shown more than enough quality there to score two goals at the Emirates against Arsenal uh, and to take it so late, to keep a clean sheet against Liverpool. um, I think that that shows the characteristics and the quality they're going to need. And I believe they can stay up. Do you know what I think about this Premier League running, right? If you look at any single side, Southampton win two back-to-back games and they suddenly go on to 29 points. Bournemouth win two back-to-back. Palace win two back-to-back, right? And suddenly they chuck themselves right out of it. And I think that's what's so fascinating about this battle at the moment. Two back-to-back wins. And you look at all those sides in the bottom relegation scrap. None of them have, none of them have put back-to-back wins together. And I think if you get a side that can do that, I think the whole dynamic of the relegation battle will change quite significantly. And I think that's the, the one thing. If you get a team, say Forest can just win three out of four, that could be them safe. You know, they, they, they could be safe by, by, you know, by one or two games to go. Uh, the same for Bournemouth, same for Southampton. If you can put a little mini run together, forget about the 9, 10, 11 games you've got, put a little mini run together, win three out of four, um, win three out of five, and suddenly the whole picture changes completely. But I do think Bournemouth can survive. Who's not going to do that then, Mark? Who's going to be sinking to the Championship it's, next do, season? Do you know what? It's, it's so tough as well. You know, I think you'd have to say Southampton because they're just their lack of goals. You'd also say Wolves <laughs> on that basis. Um, you know, they've, they've really struggled. What is it? Ten home Premier League goals this whole campaign. They've really, really struggled to to find the back of the net. So I think they, they could be there. I think Palace, like you say, the appointment, you know, Roy Hodgson didn't do the business when he went into Watford last season. They still got relegated. And my understanding at the moment is that it's either Paddy McCarthy or Roy Hodgson. So those two appointments, whilst Paddy's a brilliantly regard highly thought of coach whether he's the right man to keep the side in the Premier League I don't know um, so I'd, I'd maybe say Wolves and Palace and Southampton would be my three I think West Ham have got too much the same for Leicester I just think that, that Forest have got just that little bit of sparkle and magic um, that, that, that they need uh, I think Leeds will be be okay as well because I think they've got some quality players um, but again you know let's have this, we had this conversation at the first game after the international break and the whole picture of that bottom half of the Premier League could completely change. Um, and that's that's what's great about it. I bet you're regretting coming on now, Jacob, aren't you? <laughs> I thought someone would, someone would see some glimmer of positivity in Slamson, but if I can't see it, then yeah, I, I can understand why Mark or Matt can't either. 
It's going to be an interesting run in in this relegation battle. You've done very well for your corners, for your clubs this evening, guys. And before you go, it'd be fair for me to talk about the top of the league very, very quickly and get your thoughts on that. This is more of a calm question for you because we don't support these teams at the top. But, Jacob, there's a Premier League title up for grabs. Arsenal, I thought, were going to throw this a few weeks ago when we were 2 0 up at the Emirates. They clawed that back, and I felt like that might be season defining for them. Who wins the Premier League out of Arsenal, Manchester City? I think until this week, I've always said Man City, but I just look at Arsenal and how formidable they are. They're, I think they're getting back to their best now. They've had a, f- had a few weeks where they had a little blip. You think oh, that good some parts of feet. You thought, oh, could this be the start? And they've they've uh, completely recovered from that. So I think Arsenal will now win the league. I think they've been the best team in the league. I, I think Man City haven't really got going. They haven't really quite adjusted to Haaland, despite him scoring how many, however many goals. But you look at that Arsenal team, there's relationships all over the pitch. They look a real well-oiled machine. And if they can keep their players fit, you know, Jesus coming back, then I think they'll wrap up the league with a few games to go. Matt, Premier League title, who do you think is going to win it? Yeah, very much what Jacob said. I, you, I always thought they had kind of that Arsenal blow up in them, but winning that game against Bournemouth showed that steal. And as long as they don't get injuries to to that clutch of key players like Bakayo Saka and Aaron Ramsdale and you know, party and... Uh, Aaron, uh, people like Gabriel at the back. I think they'll be all right. They, they, William Saliba is out at the moment, and they coped really well at the weekend against against Palace with Rob Holding at the back. They seem to have that winning mentality. So, uh, and as Jacob said, I don't think Man City have been a vintage Man City. They look like a team in a bit of a transition with players hovering around the thirty years of age mark, and you feel they're perhaps a few know their their days are getting to be numbered at the club. So, yeah, I'd go Arsenal quite by a couple of points, probably. This must be a hot, to- a hot topic at Sky Sports, Mark. And even though Man City have got a cheat code, are Arsenal going to do it? I think the key has been this week, actually. I think the fact that Man City are through in the Champions League, and that's a competition that Pep Guardiola and Manchester City fans are desperate to win. Their focus naturally will gravitate towards those midweek games. Uh, and I think the fact that Arsenal got knocked out of the Europa League and the fact they don't have that Thursday night fixture now allows them to focus on one thing and one thing only, and that's the Premier League. And I think this week's been defining in not only showing that Arsenal have the the, the ability to come from behind, as they did against Bournemouth, um, but the fact that they don't have that extra fixture allows them to to have one sole focus, and that's the Premier League title. You know that Man City have got the FA Cup to, to think about. You know that they've got the Champions League to think about. And when suddenly you've got all these things on in your mind and, and the, the, the games come thick and fast at this stage of the season, that game on a Saturday and a Sunday could prove to be just one too many. So I think that that will be the defining part of this season. And I think that's where Arsenal will probably just about scrape it. But the one thing that they don't have is players that know how to get the job done. And that's the one thing that Man City have in abundance. So I think it'll be tight, but I do just fancy Arsenal. Fantastic, fantastic. I've really, really enjoyed this debate and I'm sure the fans have as well. If you've enjoyed this, do give it a like. If you've joined us interactively, thank you very much for your comments in the chat. And also, if you watch this back, let us know your thoughts in the comments. Jacob, thank you for your time. It's great to see you. I'll see you in a few weeks at St Mary's, yeah? Yeah, hopefully. And hopefully it'll be uh, as tight as it is now. (laughs) Um, Matt, thanks for coming back on and giving us your thoughts for Forest. Wish you all the best for the rest of the season. And yeah, look after yourself. Uh, yeah, and I, you know, lifting the fourth wall, you know, there was a lot of Wi Fi problems at my end. So thank you for your patience, <laughs> and Jacob and Marks as well. Very much appreciated. Yeah, there was a bit of extra editing that went into this video once it goes live, but no worries, Matt. That's absolutely fine. Mark, always a pleasure to have you on the channel. I wish you all the best for the rest of the season. I'm sure we'll see you at some point again, but thank you very much for your time. No, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you very much. Do let us know your thoughts in the comments. There's going to be lots of emotions between now and the end of the season. There'll be some hearts broken, some nails lost, but some fans will be absolutely ecstatic at the end of May. But thanks for joining us from me, Mark, Matt and Jacob. We'll see you on the next one. Up cherries.